Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambo channel. <sighs> Sorry to report, but Western Union has been through better times than this. Uh, they announced just the other day that they're going to be uh, letting go 10% of their staff. I've also got a report that shows they are a crazy amount of money in debt. Or, well, they have debt on the books. I should, I should word it that way, not as if they are net negative in terms of value. I'm not, I'm not stating that, but they have massive uh, quantities of debt. Uh, going to talk a little bit about that too because it makes me wonder, um, and, and maybe you've heard of this, but I, I wonder, Western Union, have you heard of a little company called Ripple? Their little uh, fintech startup out California way? You ever heard about them? You might want to talk. Okay, <laughs> no, I know. No, Western Union, of course, they've been uh, they, they've run uh, trials with with uh, Ripple uh, beta trials uh, of uh, X Rapid. Actually, they're still trialing it technically, but haven't moved forward. So I'm going to talk about that in this video. Uh, I'm also going to cover with you, uh, real briefly, uh, I got at least one specific quote regarding uh, the uh, news yesterday that MoneyGram, <laughs> like biggest competitor to Western Union, MoneyGram is moving forward uh, with XRapid, utilizing XRP, and I've got a specific quote. Not going to go too in-depth on that because I covered it thoroughly enough yesterday, but I want to share a specific quote with you from MoneyGram CEO Alex Holmes. Uh, also, there was a, a tweet that I saw caught my attention about uh, general partnerships and how it pertains to Ripple. There's uh, there's talk about Visa and Earthport and American Express, and uh, I see this kind of like th these concepts bandied about, oh, this could be really good for Ripple, uh, this could be really good for XRP, and I don't really see concepts fleshed out on what that actually means. So I want to share something from American Express and what they had to say about Ripple's technology and uh, just try and put everything in context to where we actually are. And then I'll wrap up the video by covering with you, for, with you a, a non-XRP related piece. Uh, is is uh, purchasing crypto with a credit card, is that equivalent to a cash advance? Well, a judge says no to Chase so on, the, on that topic, so I'll be covering that. But before we get going, if you would please delicately tap that like button. And if you are a fan of Ripple and XRP, go ahead and subscribe to the good old Moon Lambo channel. We have a party here every day. Bring your own party hats, though. All right, so uh, this is from payments.com, P-Y-M-N-T-S dot com. Western Union misses on earnings, announces 10% staff cut. And and this is news from uh, literally yesterday. It's funny enough that the same day that we had all this great news about uh, MoneyGram teaming up with Ripple, and then you hear this from Western Union, and it's like, eh, womp, womp. Uh, Western Union stock price was down in after-hours trading after missing on earnings but lodging a narrow beat on revenue. Adjusted earnings per share, EPS, came in at $0.45 cents per share, missing analyst consensus estimates of $0.48 cents per share. This compares to earnings of $0.46 cents per share a year ago, net income of $614.8 million, or $1.42 a share, $1.42 a share, in the second quarter, compared to uh, compared with $217.6 million, or $0.47 cents a share a year earlier. Uh, re revenue came in at, you know, I don't need to read that part. Let me jump down this part. In other critical statistics, consumer to consumer revenues made up 83% of Western Union's revenue in the quarter and saw a 1% decline on a reported basis or increased 1% uh, constant currency while uh, transactions grew 1%. Latin America showed the strongest growth and offset declines in the Asia Pacific region and the United States domestic market. Uh, WesternUnion.com C2C revenues were, went up 18% on a reported basis, or 20% constant currency, and transactions increased 15%. WesternUnion.com is now available in 70 nations and represented 13% of total C2C revenue. So a few things pop in my mind when I'm as I'm reading through this here. So West, Western Union, they they officially announced that they were doing a a pilot of X Rapid. It must have been about a year and a half ago. I want to say just from memory that they announced it pretty much in the same time period that that um, that MoneyGram announced as well. I think both were within a month or so of each other. But uh, we ended up getting word later in uh, in 2018 that uh, they weren't you know they weren't saying no to ripple but uh, they didn't really see any savings this or that and they'd only done about six test transactions this and that and they just talked about how their treasuries are so efficient and this and that and uh, and I saw an interview 
after that, Brad Garlinghouse was asked about this, and he responded, and he said, well, okay, the way we look at it is Western Union, they've been around for, what, over 100 years, whatever the number is. And he said, uh, so we we were able to, to do what they did in six months, <laughs> you know, especially with the, with the beta f- version of, uh, of X Rapid. And so he's like, so as efficient as their treasuries are, how about that? But he went on, and here's the thing, and here's, here's the part that I, that this is an important takeaway. Even if, even if, Western Union's treasuries make their operations just as efficient as what Ripple can offer them. There still is the issue of Western Union tying up dormant capital in the Nostro accounts, which means that it does not make sense to perpetually stick with the business model that they have, the way in which they're moving money around the world. So it won't last forever. It, it certainly won't last forever. It seems to me, for whatever reasons that uh, internally that we're, we're just not privy to, uh, they are hesitant to engage in change, but but as we've seen, not all businesses are. Look at MoneyGram; they are they're moving forward with this. And I got some. That's why I got some fun quotes that I want to share with you after I cover this piece here. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, but it, but it does make me wonder. And then you know, I theorized in the past. Well, does it have something to do with maybe they do want to move forward with this, but they don't want to show their hand? But I don't know. I, I'm not so convinced that that is the case anymore. Given that like MoneyGram's already f- moving ahead. And and another thing that I, I will admit I found fascinating is when uh, when the deal between Ripple and MoneyGram was brought to light, uh, the uh, the CEO of, of Western Union I don't think he's cited in this piece yeah, he's not and then um, oh no he is he is down here I take that back yeah Ursac there you go that that should be him. Um, he was he was on stage being interviewed for something, and he said, "Hey, we're, we're still piloting, and we we can we could do a deal today." He said something to that effect. It was it was something that's like, "Oh wow, we can sign on the dotted line now." I was like, "Okay, well that's fascinating." So they're they're not they're not throwing the whole concept out, and uh, you know even if they were a little bit uh, skittish about moving forward with the technology like this, because for whatever reason. Uh, you know they're going to have to respond to the competition period, and as I was reading through this, they're talking about how a lot of the eighty-three um, percent of their business it's consumer to consumer, and a lot of it, as I just read to you, a lot of their business it's from Latin America. Um, y- you know, it made me think actually not just so there's Latin America, but I was thinking um, what, what it made pop in mind. We're talking about high friction corridors when we're talking about Ripple's implementation of X Rapid. And you, you know the the first uh, primary corridors that that are, are being just completely dominated by Ripple, frankly, <laughs> would be uh, United States to the Philippines, United States to Mexico, uh, because there's just the most friction there, high costs, and um, a willingness for remittance companies to jump on board. Uh, more willing, uh, many of them anyway, more willing than, for instance, uh, commercial banks and financial institutions, uh, who are by nature more conservative, of course. But there is a lot of friction along those corridors, and so w- just based on the the way that um, they're situated, mind you, of course, they've got thousands and thousands of, of payments corridors. I just I, the, what I'm thinking is there are so many out there that uh, that, that could benefit from uh, re- reduced uh, payment and settlement costs, specifically with X Rapid. So when they did, uh, when Western Union did their tests, and there were whatever six transactions or some stupid number like that, they didn't see real savings. I want to ask, which corridors were they looking at? You know, because you can you can settle efficiently if you're if you're talking about uh, if you have a great relationship with a bank in another country. If you're a bank and you have a relationship with a another bank in another country, and you get you know, you're, you're um, denominating different fiat currencies, you know, if if you have that correspondent banking re- relationship just between those two, you can settle in theory pretty efficiently. You know, you just you just you just numbers on a book, you know. Uh, you, you can figure out what the conversion rate is between the currencies and then just agree that it has occurred and then agree that it's settled. So th- that's not where the most friction is. The most friction comes in when there are a bunch of intermediaries in, in between because you don't have existing banking relationships uh, with entities in every country around the world in every single uh, fiat currency that exists. So there can be some where it could be extremely efficient. So it makes me wonder, when you did these tests, Western Union, what what corridors exactly did you test in that you had such unimpressive results? Because uh, MoneyGram did tests, and they found uh, that it was highly beneficial. And so to me, this this just seems entirely nonsensical. Um, let me share with you this now. Take, take a look at this. And this is from Leonidas on, on Twitter. He tweeted out, Western Union $3.1 billion debt outstanding and th- this is brand new information this also just came out the other day uh here you go debt outstanding june 30th 2019 3.1 billion dollars if only there were a way to unlock this 
like some dormant capital and, and pay this off, you know, because of course, if you've got debt outstanding, uh, well, it could mean a couple different things. It could be a loan, uh, it could just be that you owe a vendor, it could be a number of different things, but that seems like a lot. That's a lot to have on the books there. Um, <laughs> and I'm just thinking, you've got a crazy amount of money locked up, and if you if you would just embrace a new way of moving money around the world, uh, you you would you, not that you could immediately today eliminate all of that. I don't I don't know because the corridors still need to be admittedly built out uh, by Ripple and the expansion of RippleNet. But you can unlock some of that now and start taking care of this. So it's just a, the reason I want to point it out. I'm not saying that this would solve the debt problem or the debt that they have on the books to the extent that it is a problem. Uh, they're they're willing to take on some, some amount of debt. I I get that. Uh, it could just be that they're invoices because again, this just if it's debt, it doesn't again mean that there's some sort of loan or something like that necessarily. It just it, it could just be that you, you owe vendors this or that. So okay, it doesn't matter. I'm just saying whatever it is, um, it, it does sound like a lot. And and, and even if um, so if you unlocked money that's in no share accounts and you don't want to eliminate debt, even if you didn't want to. Uh, there's all sorts of other stuff you could do with it, and it doesn't need to be tied up. It just doesn't. Now, check out this piece, and this is from what I covered yesterday, but um, <laughs> and, well, I'm not going to cover the story uh, in the same capacity I did yesterday. I wanted to share this with you. This is from dailyhodl.com. The piece is titled, MoneyGram launches Ripple's XRP-based XRapid, says it's literally settling currencies in seconds. All right, so I just want to read this little part up here at the top. International remittance giant uh, MoneyGram says its integration with Ripple's XRP-powered cross-border payment platform, XRapid, is now live. In an earnings call, MoneyGram CEO Alex Holmes revealed the company launched XRapid this week, confirming the technology can settle payments in a matter of seconds. Here's the quote. Now, this is what I really wanted to share with you. These are his exact words. I am so excited to announce today that MoneyGram is now live and transacting on the Ripple XRapid platform. We started executing trades earlier this week, and all signs point to this being a tremendously beneficial relationship for all parties involved. We are literally settling currencies in seconds. And to quote my friend Larry, this is really cool. (laughs) So there you go. (laughs) Oh, man. And then it goes on to say, MoneyGram has not confirmed whether it has started using XRapid to settle transactions on its customers' behalfs or in which of its 200 countries it plans to use the technology. So uh, granted, we don't know where it's used and we don't know to what extent it's been rolled out. But hey, they they started and... um, it's 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 all coming. And this is just this is just one aspect of the XRP ecosystem, though, and it's it's a it's something that gives investors confidence. And this is long term. Uh, I think it can help long term with the health of the XRP ecosystem and ultimately the value of XRP. So to me, this is rather significant. All right, now here's a tweet uh, from XRP Neo. Uh, I don't know what that Roman numeral number is. So wait, that would be the ten and a five. Is that sixteen? I, don't, I could be completely wrong. XVI, I might be, whatever. Anyway, so this person tweeted out, I'm sure the connection has already been made, but MoneyGram goes live with XRapid and soon together with Visa. Visa, which made a large investment in Earthport, which gives access to RippleNet now, uh, multi-hop with MoneyGram. But uh, what would the reach be also with Visa? And that's a qu- I see this question posed, and some people tend to get excited, and then they read stuff about partnerships uh, between entities outside of Ripple. But there's like there's one of the entities that is does have a relationship with Ripple, and then it's just like you, you can get these. It's it's more like have you ever heard of six degrees of separation? Pretty much no ever down the planet within six people, like six hops of each other. Well, okay, well, this is kind of true in the business world, too, and it doesn't mean that this is there's anything going on here. If you can show me exactly what these relationships would mean and if there's anything going on in the background, super duper, but uh, stuff like this, I see people in the community kind of getting excited about it and tweeting stuff up about this, and I'm always like, okay, but why? Like, what is there anything to it? Is there anything behind it? And then uh, XRP Boy responded with that, and he writes, um, I always think of the following statements when comments such as yours are made, Neo. Uh, it's, cr- it's crazy, brother. Lionel is right. This is one heck of a project. XRP is literally scratching the surface. Uh, crazy. We have to be patient. They're literally revamping value. And then there's a couple images here from the American Express website that uh, XRP Boy put here. And I actually would like to read read this here. This is... It, seriously, it's fascinating, and there are some specific details on here that I'm willing to bet some of you are unaware of about how some of this technology works. And uh, even if you are aware, it would be a good refresher on a couple of these things. But uh, so this is again American Express here in the right. As of April 2018, 
Ripple said it had signed up more than 100 financial institutions compared with Swift's more than 11,000. However, the companies using Ripple's cross-border payment software include some major international payment providers operating in multiple countries, as well as domestic banks, so its coverage is broader than indicated by simple numerical comparison. Uh, Participating financial institutions typically install XCurrent behind their firewall. XCurrent includes the distributed ledger used to record transactions, as well as messaging and payment validation software, according to Ripple. XCurrent also includes a rulebook designed to ensure operational consistency and legal clarity for Ripple cross-border payments. Ripple cross-border payments may involve correspondent banks. Using XCurrent, the financial institutions involved in the payment send messages to each other in real time to confirm payment details prior to initiating the transaction and to confirm delivery once it settles. I want to point out here before I read further, and this is actually a really key piece. What, what I wrote here. This is this is this is the reason that messaging software is an actual product for Ripple. It's it's it sounded mind blowing to them when, they, when when Ripple got into this and they were trying to figure out their strategy years and years and years ago. They found out that just the messaging portion of their software is a product in and of itself. Without crypto, without cryptocurrency existing, this is a product, right? And and, and a big part of it is it's what I wrote right here. Uh, read right here. And uh, let's, let me read that one more again, one more time here again. Um, using XCurrent, the financial institutions involved in the payment send messages to each other in real time to confirm payment details prior to initiating the transaction and to confirm delivery once it settles. Okay, that part at the end, confirming delivery once, once it settles, Swift doesn't do that. It doesn't do that. You, you push a payment through and you hope it gets there. And if it doesn't, you're never going to know unless somebody contacts it. That's it. It's called unidirectional messaging. That is not the case with Ripple software. It is bi-directional software. And I know it sounds like such a simple co- concept, but from a technological perspective, there is no easy way to do that. You're going to ensure that every, every um, intermediary in, in between ever, in this bilateral chain of banking relationships, that if something goes wrong, they're going to push, you're, you're just, you're going to ensure that they, they push a message backwards to, to, the, to where it originated. Like to what you're gonna when you don't have a relationship with them, you're gonna ensure that. So of course, then that's why you get failures. Uh, I mean, about six percent of these transactions fail, and then you have to figure out where it went wrong, and you have to hunt on all these problems. At least with this, with with Ripple's technology, like there's messaging, there's actual messaging back and forth. Anyway, so uh, then the, the piece proceeds here. Uh, the payers bank initiates the process by using Ripple's messaging to gather the required information, including a quote for all fees charged by each bank in the chain as well as the FX rate. This lets the payment corridor inform the customer in advance about the total cost of sending the payment in contrast to the fee uncertainty associated with traditional bank-initiated cross-border payments. Guys, this is absolutely crucial, and maybe some of you are aware of this, but if, and even if so, this is a, a great opportunity for a refresher here. Understand that when these transactions were initiated, nobody actually knew what the final cost would be at the end. You don't know how much of your money would, would be spit out the, at the other end after each little piece, uh, each, each little uh, you know, uh, intermediary, the correspondent banking system, takes their, their pieces uh, <laughs> as the money keeps moving on down the path to get to its final destination. Fee uncertainty. So not only do you not know if it's, it's, if it's going to go through because it, it's unidirectional, uh, you also don't know what it's going to cost. <laughs> okay, there's a better way to do this. And Ripple found it. Ripple software then places a hold on the funds at the banks involved and updates each bank's ledger to execute the payment. The company says the settlement process completes within seconds. The company also says that because the ledgers are updated simultaneously in a Ripple cross-border payment, settlement risk is eliminated. And that's another key thing that you weren't possible to do through traditional settlement rails through the SWIFT system. And uh, let me get to the next piece here. Oh, right, here we go. Uh, then according to Rethinking Correspondent Banking, banks until recently had little incentive to innovate due in part to a lack of competition, particularly since business-to-business cross-border payments generate much higher profit margins than domestic payments. Now, however, customer expectations for cross-border payments are rising due to factors such as the proliferation of real-time domestic payment services and the growth of e-commerce. At the same time, banks face increasing competition from fintech innovators uh, who offer low-cost international payments. Banks' costs are also rising due to regulatory initiatives such as KYC and AML rules, 
according to McKinsey's Global Payments 2016 report. Thus, as the correspondent banking report notes, banks need to make cross-border payments cheaper, more transparent, and more efficient. Another McKinsey analysis uh, also published in 2016 found that to remain competitive, banks must, this is a cool part, check this out, in order to remain competitive, banks must dramatically reduce their operating costs for cross-border payments from an estimated $25 to $35 to as low as $1 to $2. That's what the McKinsey analysis says. Again, and that's from 2016, which is the, the most recent one I'm aware of anyway on this topic. But again, they say you got to reduce the cost for cross-border transactions from $25 to $35 to $1 to $2. Where do you think we're heading here? That's why I'm telling you guys, like, for me, none of this is financial advice, of course, and I have to say that in every video because it's the right thing to do, and I'd feel guilty if I didn't, because this is just, uh, this is just a, you know, a show full of fun topics from my perspective anyway. But uh, to me, it just seems like a no-brainer that this technology would be adopted because, flatly stated, there is no other alternative. There's actual technology today that solves this problem. The, the problem of settlement that works in a ton of great, a ton of to many situations when it comes to settlement, uh, especially that the more high friction, the more reasonable it is to, to consider taking on the technology. And given that it actually works, that means that there's real utility for XRP. Of course, it's going to be adopted. That's how I feel. It, to me, it's just a matter of time, and I'm happy to wait. I think part of the reason the price action is, is um, behaving the way it is, though, it's not it's not it's solely relying upon good news and. Um, you know, successful trials and then production versions of software going into uh, real world use, as is the case with XRAP. But it's not just that. It's the whole concept of this new asset class with people not understanding the things that you and I are aware of within the XRP community. Like, we know a lot of stuff that almost no one else on the planet does. That's the truth here. And, you know, it, what we're really waiting for is acceptance of the entire asset class. So while you might feel kind of bummed out that XRP price is what it is, to me it's just a buying opportunity really, and so I do continue to purchase. But it, it's it's not like um, this is a vote on the value of XRP. It's it, Everybody with their dollars, as it pertains to investing in crypto, they're voting on whether or not, whether or not the asset class will have staying power. And so that's why you do keep seeing it go up, and then there will be higher floors every time after massive drops. And so that's good, and we are going to keep heading that direction too, but that's what's actually going on here. So to me, it's just like, patience. It's okay. All right, last piece for this video. This is from Cointelegraph. Judge to chase. Buying crypto on credit, not necessarily a cash advance. Southern District of New York Judge Catherine Polk I don't know if I'm saying that right, but whatever. I never know if I'm saying names right, frankly. Unless it's something simple like John. I can say with high confidence that John is how John is pronounced. But the rest of these names, no, no, no. And the more foreign it sounds to me, the more I'm going to butcher it. So anyway, Catherine Polk Faya has ruled that purchasing cryptocurrency with a Chase Bank credit card does not necessarily count as a cash advance as per Chase's contract. According to an opinion and an order document dated August 1st, Judge Faya has denied Chase's motion to dismiss a number of the plaintiff's complaints, which center on the bank charging a user cash advance fees for buying cryptocurrency with a Chase credit card. The plaintiffs are Brady Tucker, Ryan Hilton, and Stanton Smith, who have brought a, a class action suit against the banking giant Chase. In the document, Faya summarized their class action suit as follows. This claim, indeed, the entirety of plaintiff's suit, is built on an argument that acquisitions of cryptocurrency could not be classified as cash, cash advances within the meaning of contracts, with, uh, the contracts. Chase disagrees, claiming that cryptocurrency acquisitions are cash-like transactions pursuant to the contracts, and thus cash advantage advances. The party's dispute thus boils down to a difference of opinion concerning the proper interpretation of the term cash-like transaction. And then the piece proceeds. The reason that a number of Chase's dismissal motions have not gone through uh, is, is because Judge Fye believes that the plaintiffs have provided a reasonable interpretation of the term cash-like transaction in the context of Chase's contract. As Fye also explains in the document, the plaintiffs are interpreting the word cash as referring only to fiat money and cash-like referring only to legally recognized claims on cash, such as checks, money orders, and wire transfers, and notably not cryptocurrency. The defendants, on the other hand, believe that the term cash-like transactions applies to any means of payment, 
cryptocurrency based or otherwise which to me always seems like a, a, a silly concept because you can't use cryptocurrencies really like money it's not easy it really try using cryptocurrency maybe some of you do i'm sure some of you do actually but it's not easy and it, they're not widely accepted that's like trying to use a house as currency there's almost as much friction there you know like it's kind of ridiculous <laughs> Or like trying to use like a bar of gold as as actual currency to buy coffee or something like that. It's just it's just not easy. So I think that this whole thing's silly. But anyway, uh, the piece continues. Notably, Judge Faya has not sided with the plaintiffs and said that the their interpretation interpretation is correct. Uh, rather, Faya has simply noted that their interpretation is plausible enough for them to proceed with their class action case. Faya wrote, at this point in the proceedings, however. It is irrelevant whether Chase's interpretation of cash-like transactions is more reasonable than the plaintiffs, because plaintiffs have identified a reasonable interpretation of cash-like transactions that would exclude purchases of cryptocurrency. The breach of contract claim survives the motion to dismiss. So that's all I got for you today. I am not a financial advisor. Do not buy or sell anything because of anything that I say are right. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the moon, Lambo!